battlefield in Bor, in the middle of South Sudan. This UN helicopter is about to cross the front lines into rebel territory. After months of talks, both sides have promised not to shoot it down. The children have been waiting for this day for a long time. Some very happy passengers. Not only are they getting a free helicopter ride, but this will be the first time they have seen their parents in nearly two years. The children are from the Nuer tribe, like most of the rebel fighters. When government troops attacked their villages, parents left the children at a base for UN peacekeeping troops. The adults, all civilians, then trekked more than 200 miles across shifting front lines to find a safe new home, a journey too dangerous for children. Today, they'll finally see each other again. Tell me how special today is for you. We're at an airfield in Bor, in the middle of South Sudan. This UN helicopter is about to cross the front lines into rebel territory. After months of talks, both sides have promised not to shoot it down. The children have been waiting for this day for a long time. Some very happy passengers. Not only are they getting a free helicopter ride, but this will be the first time they have seen their parents in nearly two years. The children are from the Nuer tribe, like most of the rebel fighters. When government troops attacked their villages, parents left the children at a base for UN peacekeeping troops. The adults, all civilians, then trekked more than 200 miles across shifting front lines to find a safe new home, a journey too dangerous for children. Today, they'll finally see each other again. Tell me how special today is for you. Do, do, do you did you think you would ever see this day? Great to see those children back home, back with their families, where they belong. But families are still being fractured as the fighting continues in South Sudan. Across both sides, there are now more than two million displaced people. We're returning to the government side of the lines and South Sudan's capital, Juba. Martin Odiambo works here for Save the Children with backing from UNICEF. He registers children who've become separated from their parents across both sides of this war. In this database, we have all names of children that have ever been registered, 9,980. That's just the registered ones? The registered ones. So we don't know how many are still out there yet to be registered. Living in the bush, waiting for your help. Exactly, exactly that is. He tells me about a case he's currently working on. P E O L U. Uh -huh. That's the child, and that's the photo of the child. Yeah. Eight-year-old Machar Paul is in a UN camp. Martin's mission is to get him back to his family. When we get one match, only one child's marching in the system, we celebrate because getting one child to be with the father, it's a big achievement for the entire team. But that one child, you're making a big difference to that child. Yeah. Machar is stuck in the north, where the fighting is fiercest. I'm on my way to see him. A UN flight takes us close to a town called Bentu. Today, it's government-controlled, 
but it has changed hands three times in the last two years. That's not reassured me, future the owner. It took decades of war for South Sudan to break away from Sudan. But now the conflict is from within, and the UN protects those who've been forced to flee the fighting. For many people across the country, they will have known nothing apart from war. In 2011, 98% of South Sudanese voted for independence. But you know what? Hope pretty soon made way for yet another conflict. This time, the president fell out with the vice president, and much of the fighting has now been along ethnic lines. The newer tribe on one side, the Dinka on the other. Here, the people seeking protection are mostly from the Nuer tribe, while the government troops controlling the area are mainly from the Dinka tribe. In rebel areas, it's Dinka people who shelter inside UN camps. No one has a monopoly on suffering. I tell you what, that's mind blowing. I had no idea it was going to be this big. I mean, there, there are shelters as far as you can see. There are 130,000 people in this camp. And to give you an idea of just how quickly this place has expanded, two years ago, only 5,000 and more are turning up every day. Uh, trying to find one child in all of this, where do you start on that one? I meet Sammy Gatwich, one of the camp's child protection officers. We're going to see a boy called Maisha. Uh, that's why I've been separated from his father. Malay. Macha is the little boy whose photo I saw in the database. He's living here with his grandmother. Uh, <laughs> Machar was left in his home village as his father travelled to the capital for work. Then the fighting began. Masha, what was happening in your village to make you When did you last see your father? <laughs> Even compared to the other children, he looks very underweight. You see his elbows and very thin. Why is that? Uh, this one, he was thinking about his father, and then she, she didn't get the about the, the father that uh, if I could have him with my father, I could be a very fat cousin. So he's thin because he's worried. Yeah, because he's worried. Machar last saw his parents almost two years ago. You can't help but feel very strongly for that little lad because uh, he was just unlike any eight, nine-year-old. I've ever met before. He was not smiling really when he was playing with other kids. He wasn't engaging with them. When I was talking to him, very little in his eyes. He's seen a heck of a lot. Meanwhile, Gatwich is looking for more separated children. At the moment, they're just running through the shouting at the megaphone. These are families they're interested in, children that they can't trust, seeing if anybody comes up to them with information. Some refugees from the latest fighting have arrived, among them children. Gatwich takes the little girl's details. Her father is missing and her mother has fled to a neighboring country. Gatwich adds her name to the database of separated children. 
Why did you choose to do this work? Uh, we have chosen uh, to do this work because uh, we have seen that uh, all our children are suffering a lot from this crisis. Uh, some of them are going every day outside. Maybe they might be attackable there. Even here, with UN protection, as soon as they step beyond the razor wire, children are at risk. So when the children go outside the camp to collect firewood, or they are attacked? Yeah, they are attacked. They are killed? They are killed. The South Sudanese government deny their troops have carried out any atrocities, but say they're investigating. Is this bit? Machar tells me he thinks about his father all the time. There's been some amazing news. The team back in Juba have positively identified Machar's father in a camp in the capital. This means I can show Machar the first pictures he's seen of his dad in two years. <laughs> UNICEF hoped that if the fighting doesn't get worse, they can fly Machar to his father within days. They tell him that his mother and older brother are in neighbouring Uganda. His dad stayed behind in the capital, waiting for him. <laughs> Machar has lived a quarter of his life in this camp. He really shouldn't be here for a day, let alone a childhood. The living conditions seem terrible, they seem harsh, rough. Yeah, this is a terrible place, as you can see. You've got kids here um, playing next to sewage, they've got no choice. And if you come down there, cream, I mean, the mosquitoes on the top of that water. Yeah, it's no wonder these children get poorly. It's one and it's very dangerous for the children. This place is increasingly overcrowded. There's fighting close by, and more people keep arriving. Gatwich checks in on Machal. Machal's grandmother has been taking care of him overnight. Okay. Poor little Machal, with everything else he's got in his place, is feeling sick. Suspicion automatically goes in this camp to malaria. Machar heads in to see a doctor. He's been through an awful lot for an eight-year-old boy. Machar uh, had seen so many difficulties, dead bodies, uh, and his so people have been killed. The civil war, and before that, decades of fighting as South Sudan struggled to split from Sudan, means this is a country where conflict has touched everyone. 
uh, my father and I uh, in conflict when we were fighting with her uh, uh, to get our uh, independence. How does it affect you, Gawish? It affects me very much. It affects me in my heart. Uh, I wish if I could have been born, I could have not been born in South Sudan. Hi. Hi. How are you? You're fine. What's happened? Uh, been he malaria. He's got malaria. Yeah. Wow. Malaria is the number one killer of children in this camp. At the Médecins Sans Frontières Hospital, three children are dying every day from the disease. So you stand outside this hospital entrance and do you just realize how many people are dropping dead in this camp? You can't protect yourself against the mosquito bite as a father, how do you protect your daughter or your son from something like that? And it's just pathetic, hopeless existence. And no human being should have to look like this. The doctors have caught Machar's malaria early enough to stop it becoming life-threatening. Now he needs to get some rest. He's got to catch a UN flight in just two days' time. While the hunts on for missing parents, Gatwich tries to arrange for children to be looked after by other families. Teresa is taking care of her former neighbor's three daughters. <laughs> Nyapuka is the eldest sibling at 19. Aid agencies say the latest fighting is bringing a new level of brutality, often against innocent children. There are reports of boys castrated and left to bleed to death. Young girls gang raped and murdered. Children thrown into burning buildings. The victims are from both sides. You walk round and you meet all the kids and they say Malay, which is hello or how are you? And you can be in a bit of a false state really because everyone seems happy. But you wander into a couple of these shelters and there are stories there that just rip your heart out. And I've seen a couple of those today and you move away from being upset. And then you feel angry, probably like they do, that actually the politicians can't sort the stuff out and end this war that are driving people here. Machar is recovering well, and he's expecting to fly to his dad tomorrow. But now, there's another problem. Uh, the news of today, maybe uh, there might be very bad news uh, for Machar to hear them. Uh, as uh, Sidra told me that uh, the father of Machar has gone to Uganda. <coughs> Machar's brother in Uganda has been taken ill, so his dad has rushed across the border. The reunion may be off. It's Gatwich who has to break the bad news. I do have my doubts about how this is going to go. This my nine-year-old has an absolute meltdown. Something she's promised doesn't happen, but it's never been as significant as what this little boy's going to hear. Gatwich asks us to wait outside. In South Sudan, when something's cancelled, it may take months to set up again. Fighting, weather, lack of resources can cut off areas indefinitely. But then, information from UNICEF that changes everything. So the news is, we have a message from the father. 
um, we got a hold of him in Uganda. Uh, and he said that he's very sorry that he couldn't be there. He will try to get there Saturday or Sunday. And then, um, and he's very happy that Matara is coming. Go do the happy news. No. No, we do a ling and water. No. We do a ling and Okay. <laughs> what a difference 60 seconds makes. So we now have news that his father is going to be in Juba, hopefully over the weekend. Masha chuffed a bit. He's going to Juba tomorrow. Amazing to see that little boy smile again. The day of the big reunion is here. I like it that Masha can go to his father. But will you miss him a little bit? I will miss him. Reunions are only organized for children. So Machar's great-grandmother has to stay behind. <laughs> Machar lands in Juba and is driven to the meeting point. Wait begins. So it's not that car. I can't cope with this tension because every single car, I think it's going to be him. Every bloke walking through the gate, I think it's going to be him. The car coming down top of the hill. Mariel managed to move his family to safety in Uganda, but Machar was lost in the chaos. Mariel decided to stay behind in Juba until his son was found. He's had some dark moments. I always think a lot, how can I get my child out from there? Mind that two years now. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Mario plans to take his son to Uganda to be reunited with the rest of the family. <laughs> One son finally back with his father. A 
As we left, the rebels and the government signed a peace deal. Within days, they were fighting again. <laughs>